Hello and welcome to another model building workshop. I am Mr. Allen coming to you on behalf of the Community Libraries of Providence. I'm here in Providence, Rhode Island in my basement workshop. And today we're going to be talking about a Japanese fighter. Well, everybody knows the Zero, but not everybody knows Oscar. And if you're really into World War II aviation, you probably should know Oscar. Well, the Japanese Zero was the probably the most produced Japanese fighter plane of the war. The Japanese Zero was the Navy's top fighting plane, most produced fighting plane. And Oscar was that for the Army. This is the Army's main fighter plane in World War II. So this kit is by Azagawa. And it is the Nakajima KI-43 dash one Hayabusa which is the Peregrine Falcon uh, is the translation for that and the allied code name for this plane was Oscar with zero the zero with Mitsubishi was the Zeke this is Oscar so Oscar the KI-43 was designed to replace got a small 172nd scale version of this here the Nate and the Nate was the main fighter for the Japanese Army in 1939 and 40. This is the one that uh, was fighting over Russia in the uh, Namenhan incident in Mongolia, Manchuria area. Um, so that's the Ki-27, and that's got the uh, fixed landing gear. And uh, for those of you that uh, have seen my Previous episodes on that plane, I, I did a, a series of them a while back <laughs> when we started this uh, YouTube channel. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, please go and look for it. Uh, we do the construction and we do the whole thing. Of course, that's up the Tamiya. Um, it's a larger 148 scale kit, not 172nd. I also have a Hazagawa 172nd Oscar here, too. And a dark green, same as this one here. But this is the uh, the Type 2, as it has the three-bladed propeller there. So this is an upgraded version from the Type 1. The Type 1, as you can see, just has the twin-blade propeller. This is the earlier version. So... So the original designs of this plane were a little bit, a little bit heavy and didn't maneuver very well. So they ended up designing these. I think they're called butterfly flaps, which are underneath, on the bottom here. You see that metallic blue. So you've got these two butterfly flaps down here, which help the turn. So this thing could pretty much out turn and out maneuver. A whole lot of aircraft during the uh, early stages of World War II, and these things were in service throughout the war as they they got upgraded and upgunned. So this is a very maneuverable, good dogfighter. Uh, the main drawback was that the armament was two machine guns. You know, it, it, the Zero had also had two cannons in the wing, but this did not. This just has the two machine guns in the nose. So let's have a look. This is the combat aircraft of World War II. I use this book quite a bit on this channel since it is a pretty good source. This plane was used by the Japanese, Thailand, and post-war Thailand, and uh, France, Indochina, post-war. France made use of the uh, abandoned Oscars that were still in the field in, in French Indochina. And Indonesia also used them, apparently against the Dutch uh, colonial uh, administration. The Indonesians also used captured or abandoned Oscars as well. 
So this was a smaller, lighter, and cheaper aircraft to make than the uh, than the Zero, and it was one of those uh, situations like the Zero where the um, basically everything was sacrificed for maneuverability. So that was the thing. They wanted speed maneuverability, which was the key things that fighter planes had to have in the Japanese tradition at the beginning of World War II. And once they figured out a few issues, uh, became the you know a top dogfighter. And uh, these things were able to outturn and outfight a lot of stuff back in the day. So a total, I think, of it says here 5,919 were delivered, which included 2,629, which were built by uh, Tachikawa as well. So here is the schematics of that plane. And the armament. Let's talk about the armament for a bit. Originally, like this one here, this has the... Uh, Actually, it's true. This is the 1A and 1B. So the 1A had two 7.7 millimeter machine guns in it. And then there was the, the, you know, the 1A. And then the 1B had one 12.7 millimeter machine gun and one 7.7 millimeter machine gun. The 1C had two 12.7s. And then the Type 2 had two 12.7 millimeter machine guns. And it could carry wing racks for a couple of 250 kilogram bombs if necessary or if needed. Anyway, so the first flight was in 1939. It was, let's see, production de delivery was 1941. Yeah, and produced through 1944. Okay, now we'll take a look at the instructions. How it was to build this plane. So this is in what's here. I guess it's the same thing, but it's not. So this is the standard Hazagawa format for the you know, the map-like instruction sheet. This has pretty good paint call-outs on here if you want to paint it. You know, the detail there. It's nicely explained. You could have the wing. Got the wing tip parts there. Set of pieces, the engine, it's all there. There was a thought at one point on the early prototypes of reverting back to fixed landing gear for the, for the weight issue, but that did not happen. There's the socket and everything. This has the uh, a nice um, like a rubber retaining ring for the propeller, which I think is a pretty nice idea. Easier, and we have a couple of different color schemes here. A little bit dark green overall top, and the undersides. There's a choice of the army gray color underneath, or in this case, this was the uh, bare aluminum silver. So. One was in Burma in 42. Actually, the other one doesn't say where it is. This is uh, October 1942. So this, so, this was quite fun to build. I enjoyed it. The only real challenging thing I found on this was those butterfly flaps. There's not much for pins holding that thing onto the aircraft. 
So I found that those were a little challenging to uh, get there and to hold them down. I kept wanting to drop off and pop off. And the other issue I should say, which might be apparent when you see this, is the decals, which actually work quite well. I'm not going to fault the decals. It's just doing such large stripes on the wings in a decal was a little frustrating. I managed to get them, but yeesh. But that's the uh, paint schemes for for the particular examples we have that came with the you know the decal sheet of this kit. I opted for the one with the added yellow because I thought that added some more color to it. It's got the other uh, rising sun emblem on the wings and on the uh, sorry on the fuselage. So this this was just all decaled out and for better or for worse I wanted the one that had the most markings. Because I thought it had the most color. Back to the the fun of the folding map here. The other one, well, it's not that big of a difference really, but the other one has the top version has slightly less decals, although maybe not that much in the long run. Although you do have that arrow emblem, which is a little tricky put on which I did manage to do on the 72nd scale so that scale uh, it worked and so that squadron which is as we looked is in Burma so this is one that tended to be in that theater of operations which is where a lot of these were with the army the mainland of Asia and Southeast Asia Wherever the army was, these were there. So again, I find Hazegawa kits to be a lot of fun to build. The detail is really top notch. And they just come out looking really, really nice. The decals are great. Even these difficult stripes are really. you have it. So again, if you're not familiar with Oscar, I recommend you get familiar with him. <laughs> Another graceful Japanese fighter plane. And these are the Hasegawa ones. Hold on for just a second. I see if we can search for another one. So another option, and perhaps a cheaper option, is uh, this one from area A-R-I-I, -I, which was the old Otaki molds from the 70s. So these kits are around at pretty astonishingly low prices, I thought. And for those of you that have been watching this channel, I've showed you a couple of kits from this range already. Color schemes there. There's a silver one, home defense. Let's have a look at Otaki. Okay, so there's your decals. One thing that you need to get used to if you're going to do one of these airy Otaki kits is that the decal sheet, the decal options that you get may not necessarily be what's on the box. Why that is, is kind of a mystery. I think they just have the old artwork that they recycled. <laughs> I think that's what's going on here, but they may offer something completely different inside. So don't get too emotionally attached to the artwork. I mean, you can always cut this out and hang it up, but you may not be able to build that kit. <laughs> Yeah, because they even show they even show you the double zero one here. And to, actually they show it to you in two different camouflage options, but there's no decals to do said aircraft. No. You do have well, actually you don't even have the home defense plane done exactly correctly either. So let's have a look in in here. Well, I guess you do. Hang on. 
And again, <laughs> they show you this great, I love how they give you this great artwork that you can, that you, you can use here. It's a beautiful picture, beautiful illustrations. But, you know, the top one, again, isn't really here. Um, I mean, I guess you could do, they give you a red stripe and a number 45. You can see the 45. I suppose you could do that and like this. And the home defense fighter here, because it's got that white flag, you would have to paint that white stripe and put your decals over it. Which is not impossible, but, you know, anyway. I'm getting cluttered over here. Such is life. <laughs> so let's take a look at some other stuff in here. So. Typical me, I was doing some research on other types of decal options you have for this kit. And there's quite a bit there, including that cool tie version with the elephant. See it? So that kind of intrigued me. And they even have the uh, the Dutch ones. Uh, I mean, that's sorry, the Indonesian ones. The Indonesian ones are kind of fun because it's got the red, the red and white flag, but what they did is they just painted over part of the Japanese emblem with some white and made the Indonesian flag. See? Kind of interesting. And as you see here, they've got one that's kind of bare metal on one half and green on the other. So what the uh, Indonesians were doing was basically cannibalizing what was left on the airfields after the war and building and aircraft out of the parts that were sitting there it created an instant air force you know just add water right <laughs> and that's how they did it so anyway so there are some options that gives you a whole bunch of data on what that is if you were to buy the uh empire city decals option which is something i was debating don't know didn't get that far yet and again it still shows you Double zero. Oh, you you can't build that. So, and there's the instructions. So, if you're money conscious, this is a good good option. But the detail is not going to come to that level. How's a has got the detail through the roof? Um, but you will get. A decent looking plane. It's just it's gonna have raised uh, panel lines for the most part. I mean, I get the rivets, so I shouldn't say that. I was fooled. No, this actually has pretty good recessed panel lines and rivet marks. And it's got some flash. There's pretty much no detail to that engine, though. To be fair, there's not any indication of really push rods. Or anything I can already see in the uh, you can see that too if you look at the engine there where the hole is for the propeller it is off-center so that's going to be lots of fun to correct that interior detail is not great and you've got some nasty sinkholes in there you know push marks for the ejector pins so there's some cleanup you would need to do here or just live with it and have some fun painting it and put it together. So how much you would see of the interior in that, I don't know. You can't see a whole lot in this plane, even though it's got a nice interior. There's not a whole lot you can really see through that. Because the lighting down here doesn't help. But you can't really see much, even though it is spectacular inside there. You know, the pilot figure is basic. detail anyway. I don't know how basic the man himself is. I didn't ask him. Um, I didn't see his resume. But, um, you know, you get your gas tanks there, three, pl three pl uh, bladed propeller, new wings. One thing that's kind of fun with these old Ataki molds is if you look at the uh, wheel wells, there's, you, you almost have to put the wheels down in a sense because 
the wheel wells really aren't deep enough. If those wheels were to retract, they, they couldn't fit in that shallow uh, <laughs> position that they created for you. So anyway, I'm blabbering on. It's been a long day. And uh, I know you guys have other things you need to do, so I don't want to go on much longer. But Oscar is a fun plane. Clunk, clunk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out of sorts today. But and it does have some fun camouflage schemes too. I mean, I don't have the best indicating indicate. Don't have the best examples to show you. But in some cases they did have these really cool spotted versions, you know, either the camouflage is done on the um bare metal silver there, the aluminum color of the plane, or you know, they would coat this with an overall uh Japanese army gray and do the camouflage on that. It tended to depend on where these planes are stationed or what units they were going to because frequently they would send the planes to these units in either bare metal or in the overall light gray, you know, like this one here, the light gray. So I think I may have made a short story long. But anyway, <laughs> have a good time building your models. Uh, stay safe. Keep on building. And just a point of reference here, it's bare metal, but just got to remember that these uh, flaps here, they tended to be cloth, so they tended to be painted in the army gray. Okay, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that does it for the Oscar, and uh, we'll talk to you guys real soon.